my granddaughter came out to my studio and my table room was set up. Oh, she was just fascinated. And could she try it? And I said, sure, you can have anything in here that you can find. And she found my sparkly stuff. She had fun with that. She, But the diversity, she was weaving with purple sewing thread. It was, I, I thought, you know, we should all be like a seven-year-old in that regard. Just wide open to the possibilities, the what ifs. That's what you say, what would you like to do? I would like, I wish we all had that lack of inhibition. Hello, and welcome to the New York Guild of Handweavers Member Spotlight. My name is Katie Clements, and I'm the membership chair of the Guild. With almost 200 members, the New York Guild of Handweavers provides inspiration, information, and mutual support to anyone interested in weaving, tapestry, spinning, or fiber arts through speakers, workshops, as well as our lending library. Go to nyhandweavers.org for more information. Today, we will talk with New York Guild member Charlene Marietti. Charlene has been making things with thread for as long as she can remember. As a child, she learned to sew, embroider, crochet, and tat, but trained for a career in clinical laboratory medicine rather than the arts, which were her first love. On a trip to the Southwest, a vegetable dyed Navajo rug introduced her to the world of spinning, dyeing, and weaving. She took weaving classes and workshops whenever and wherever possible as she and her young family were relocated in corporate moves. While living in London, she was accepted into an intensive two-year course that accumulated in a City and Guilds of London Institute Certificate in Creative Studies and Textiles and College Certificate in Creative Crafts from London College of Furniture, now London Metropolitan University, with specialization in weaving and kumuhimo. Her work has been featured in juried and invitational shows in the U.S. and abroad. Although she primarily focuses on weaving, she prefers an integrated approach to fiber art discipline, which translates to using whatever technique is most appropriate for any given project. Okay, so welcome, Charlene. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being a part of the Member Spotlight series. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about you and your fiber art. So how did you get started in uh, art or fiber art? I have been doing, working, I call it playing with thread since I was a very young child. My grandmother took me under her wing and, you know, I did crocheting and just anything that was related to thread, as it were. And I sewed a lot of, so I've always done fiber. Uh, and, but it was a trip and I can even tell you the year. And in 1968, we went out west to the southwest and we went to Four Corners Trading Post, which Four Corners is at the juncture of four states. Uh, I believe that's uh, northeastern New Mexico to a trading post that had piles of Navajo rugs, beautiful Navajo rugs. Now, we were just married. We didn't have any money, but we did eke out a Navajo rug, which I did send you the picture of. It's a vegetable dyed Navajo rug that I just loved. And that set me on the path to spinning, dyeing, and weaving. And um, the point of that is I started with spinning, which that is its whole other story. I, I had no idea what I was doing. And I really didn't have any support group or guild that, that I was aware of at that time. Um, so I just kind of kept going. But very quickly, I realized that I needed to focus. I couldn't spin everything, dye everything, and weave everything. I had to choose. And um, I chose to do weaving. Though I still do bits of the other. I still dye things when I need to, and I do still spin. So, and other other things that are related. Um, well, since you focused on weaving, what do you love? What is it that you love about weaving? What I love about the whole field is the breadth. You can never, I in if I lived 500 years, I could never explore all the 
points of weaving and all the things. I find it very interesting. Maybe you have found this yourself. Uh, you're asked to self-identify as to your level of weaving. Now, I have been part of some of those uh, surveys, and it is impressive to me that very, very, very few people self-identify as advanced. I totally get it because I don't identify as advanced because there's so much I don't know and so much I haven't done. So I, I think it's you, you could study from now till the day you die and not run out of interesting things. You mentioned having trained in a career in lab, clinical laboratory medicine. Uh, does your work in that field have anything com in common with weaving? I would say that the only thing really in common um, is my scientific training to think logically. Uh, you know, I had some years out with when I had children and I went back to work and I went to back in a lab. I, I, I taught and so forth, but a woman there had decided that she wanted to get her degree, and I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't science because science was too hard, but she couldn't do the math to do diluents. And I thought, I can think anyway. <laughs> so that's, that's what I credit. <laughs> the... I don't know whether you listen to uh, the textiles and tea with the H Hand Weavers Guild of America does. But I was reminded of that, actually. Kathy often brings up the point that she finds so many people with scientific backgrounds. Yeah. And I had honestly not thought about that aspect till she kept bringing it up. And I thought, well, actually, that is a logical progression. It, it, there is. It, it, there's a lot of math in weaving. There's a lot of problem solving, even in getting your loom in working order, the mechanics of that. I mean, there really, it isn't, you know, it's, it's, which is what we all love, isn't it? The challenge of, of it, as well as the satisfaction of doing something that we love. Yeah. There was a time that I had hoped to uh, have a business and I did have a small business for a while in fiber arts, but I, you know, that doesn't pay a lot of bills or so. Yeah. What were the challenges of having a fiber arts business? The challenges are cheap goods. At about the time uh, when I moved back to the States, that was, that was the, the pivotal time and China opened up at that time. And when China opened up, the market was flooded with what we now know of cheap goods and and people weren't willing to spend the money for other handcrafted things it's still a problem there is a small market obviously but uh certainly it's much decreased from what it was say uh even even 30 years ago so now you have uh a shepherd in the family that right yes my daughter yes and she gave a program last year maybe yeah yes is that your yarn it, is it what is that your yarn source no not necessarily uh, I actually I do spin her fleece she she does have yarn made and I have made things from her yarn uh but not at all not totally um uh, she raises Coopworth sheep. And so if they are, it's a long, long wool breed. And good, you know, it's like sheep are like anything else. Some are good for some things and others for other, very specific. And so, yes, I have used her fleece. Now she doesn't have enough for, for us to make a rug out of. <laughs> so, and it's really not coarse enough for that either. So it, it more more an outerwear. Uh, it could do a rug, but uh, not not always. Depends. So yes, I do use some, and it's it's great. It's it's lovely actually. Well, having used that um, 
There was a question from yesterday's tea and textiles. Does knowing the source of your yarn change how you use it? I love knowing where the yarn comes from. Um, in fact, okay, I'm, this is confession time. I swore that I would never weave kitchen towels. I just, no, I wasn't going to do that. And then <laughs> I started weaving kitchen towels and my family loves them. That's what they love to get for Christmas. Well, I, I love having found a source for my yarn that with it's grown in Georgia, milled in North Carolina. I know where it came from. It's local. I love knowing that source. I think that's important. Uh, I'd love to hear about your experience in the intensive two-year course you participated in. Oh, that was that was really uh, very, very excellent. Actually, the Exidian Guilds course, it, it's, I, I don't recall the date, 1897. It's under the Royal Charter. It still is in existence. It is the basis for teaching crafts in the UK. And it is an, uh, it is geared toward adults. Um, it was when I uh, had to apply, you take your portfolio and apply for admission to the to this course. It, they took, I'm going to say there were 15 or 20 of us. And we met one day a week in in East, it was in East London, out there in Bethnal Green. In, and I do find this interesting. It isn't there anymore. London College of Furniture was the name of the of the facility, which is kind of a misnomer. It was the place, as best I understand, where musical instruments were that were made. So um, yes, it just you know those are the interesting parts of that. But I met one day a week, and then a very rigorous homework, and like the British system of of education, there are no exams over those two, that two year period. Your two, your exams can't come at the end. So at the end of two years, you sit for two days of examinations. And that is one part of your total assessment. You also, all the stuff that you've created. I mean, I have notebooks of how to different craft things. Which the really nice thing about that is the breadth of textile crafts that are available to you. And when you, one of your things you mentioned was integrated, I really believe that sometimes it's, it's a good idea to have some options. You can look at a project you want to do and it doesn't really fit with maybe, maybe I'm weaving on a loom. Well, it doesn't really fit for that. Uh, a good example was a project I was doing that I wanted to combine braids, but I needed I needed some kind of a structure. Now, the structure that I ended up with was sprang. Now, when I had to learn how to do sprang, I thought it was the most god-awful thing. And why, how on earth would I ever use that? And yet, when it came to something that was going to work, that one was going to work for what I wanted. So that's my point as far as using what, you know, you, you, in a simpler way of explaining it, some things work better with knits and some with crochet and you pick what works for that. So the whole project is more important than the components. Of the exactly. Project. Whatever it takes to get there. Yes. Uh, how has your work changed over time? Ooh, that's really a good question. Oof. It has retained many of the things of similar things. In other words, I have woven rugs for, for really one of the first things I have woven. Probably I am even more of a perfectionist on finishing than I was then. Uh, how has it changed? I'd like to think it's gotten better, but some days I'm not sure that's true either. So um, I think just the joy of trying to enjoy 
all the steps in the process rather than rushing to to get it completed. So I think that's it. I think appreciating the earlier stages probably. When I applied to take part in the program that I told you about, the City and Guilds, um, I said to them, I, I really think I need a lot of work in color. And after I was admitted, the woman came to me and said, no, you, you, you don't, don't, don't worry about the color. You, that's not where you need help. <laughs> so, you know, some days you never know where you need, where you need until it all of a sudden go, okay, oh, there we go. It's okay. a constant, I think it's a constant learning, but you know what? This is one of those things we're never going to get bored. There's just so much. <laughs> so you are part of the uh, New York Guild of Hand Weavers board. Uh, what's your history with the New York Guild of Hand Weavers? Uh, you know, I, I found the New York Guild at Vogue Knitting Live, as a matter of fact. Uh, when I was really kind of looking at when I was going to be retiring and able to do much more, and um, I really was drawn to them for the programs. I, I was in, I was searching for inspiration and others' experiences. And so that's how I happened to get to the Guild. And, and I was, had worked in New York, well, my, on and off for quite a while. And so getting there wasn't the, ever the problem, but uh, yeah, so I've really enjoyed that part about it. They work hard on uh, assembling the programs, which is their real star quality. Any programs stand out to you? What stands out to me? Uh, I loved having Nels Namorowski because she was this icon to me when I started weaving and um, so it was such a joy to see her before she passed away very fortunate yes that was one of the one of the highlights well, what does being a part of a guild mean to you being part of any group means that I have an obligation to do something to help support the group. Um, so that's how I happen to have volunteered to, to participate. I think it's important, it's important to, to give back. Well, I wanna acknowledge you for all the great work you do on the newsletter. I oh. love that newsletter. <laughs> Thank you. Who or what do you find inspiring? I find many, many, many things inspiring. Uh, many that are very common. Nature is is one of them. But I, what do I find inspiring? I can find, I saw a sweater yesterday that I wanted to touch, you know? <laughs> it, it, it's all around us, you know? It is. So, um I can be easily inspired, be it the color, be it the design, be it just making the unexpected. How um, did weaving help you through COVID? Oh, well, when COVID came, I told my friends, you know, I'm an introvert. I have been training for this my entire life. And um, that lasted for about, I don't know, five or six months <laughs> and then I did miss being around people. How did it help me? I focused on weaving and I really, that really was my outlet. I did a lot of weaving, you know, useful weaving, non-useful weaving, mistakes, crazy stuff. So uh, yes, that, that was that was a godsend, frankly. As oh. long as they deliver yarn, we're in business. <laughs> I like that. Uh, what makes you respond wow to another artist's work? Um, 
it is a combination of things. It is the color, it is the, the, the design, the execution and the finish. I would say it takes those four things. And you know, you can have an absolutely spectacular design and poorly executed, it's lost. But um, I, MAD, the uh, Museum of Arts and Design, and I think it was 2015 or 16, did a, they had an exhibition. In fact, I know who the curator is, but they did not do a catalog. Probably the single best exhibit I have ever seen in one place, it was called Pathways. And it was about women um, who broke out of, of the art and of course, where did it go? It went to crafts, didn't it? So there's Annie Albers and Leonora Tawney. And, you know, she all of those, but they were all in one place. It was, that was a wow. But that was a wow because it was a breakthrough. And they were doing phenomenal things. So, Can you talk more about uh, exhibiting your work? It's a affirmation that you're doing something right. Uh, or your, but that being accepted into a some kind of exhibit, whatever it is, is always an affirmation, whether juried or not, whether by invitation or not, and it is, I think, some added incentive to encourage an encouragement to keep you going, and say, okay, now what's next? Now I need to. You know, I can need to up that game a little bit, do something better, do something uh, more, you know, different. Well, let's look at your work. So one question I have about this is uh, if you could talk about the finishing of it. Certainly. Yeah, let's. Okay, this was in the Philadelphia Guild of Hand Weaver Celebration of Fiber I'm going to say three years ago, it, it, and I'll talk about both. It's a double woven piece, okay? So it's all done on the same warp with different patterns, and, it, and the back is even different. It is finished with knitted sleeves and knitted bands. So the inside, there is no lining to it. So it's totally, it's not reversible because there is a sleeve seam but um, it did not require a lining. That was one of my goals in doing it. Talk about the design process. Do you start with sketches or how does that go? Starts with sketches of what I wanna go. So where did I wanna, how did I wanna divide that? As we're looking at it, it's the left side, the squares and the horizontal pattern and the right. And once I decided how, I was going to do it through sketches and uh, proportions. Then I went to a table loom and put the yarn on the table loom and did and worked through the set and, and how was it going to work. And after I had samples, then I put it on the big loom and wove it. And that's the back, yes. And the... Uh, the uh, weft is a is a bundled. It's blue and greens, so it's very fine threads that are grouped and used that way. And the the green that's the weft is the same yarn that the the bands and the sleeves are. Any advice for sewing with hand wovens? Yes, single advice is do not be afraid of it. <laughs> Seriously, it is not difficult to work with. It doesn't fall apart when you open it up. You you don't have to, I don't have a serger. They're very nice. I, I have way too much stuff and I don't know where I would put a serger. Though there are days that I think, well, that would be really nice to have one. Uh, I have a sewing machine that is not new, but it does a very nice overcast, um, stabilizes it, no, no problem. Okay, next. Beautiful. I'm going to enlarge this. 
Wow. That's oh, I have to I have to do a shout out here. This is my daughter in law. Oh, beautiful <laughs> uh, model. This was done uh, for one of the MAFA. I'm not sure 2019 maybe. I had been experimenting with deflected double weave. Now that there is a pattern, obviously that last jacket was double weave. It got a very nice award at the Philadelphia Guild for, I don't know, technique and excellence. I don't, something like that. This one, I wanted to do something and deflect a double weave, but I wanted an item that would have uh, selvages in end pattern that flowed from one into the pattern of the main and then back out again. And as you can see on the bottom, uh, it's reversible, but you've got more gold on the other side. So this is a wool and silk. It's, it, the fibers are slightly different. So the wool and silk blend shrinks more than the wool does, which gives you that three-dimensional look to the, fa to the fabric. Beautiful. I, I, and again, here we go. I have long strips of samples. I know people many people say, I don't like to sample. I don't like to sample. Well, I'm not wildly crazy about working on a table loom either, which is where I do most of my sampling, but it is absolutely essential to do something like this. You, you just can't, it, it's hard, much harder to pull it off is what I should say if you don't do it. But I was very pleased with this. That's more inspiration from you about sampling. <laughs> it it is is it can be very very rewarding because you can find out ahead of time what some of the major pitfalls are, as well as easily changing your tie up or even your threading to make it work. It's a much harder to do on a big loom. Because once I've gotten to that point, then I really want to get through with the finished item. And saving time, then you get to weave more. <laughs> it is, really. And besides, look, if you put it on a table loom, that's somewhere else. You can still be using your big loom, right? Yeah. So it doubles your efforts. This is the other thing I have been fascinated with for the past couple of years. Um, I did... Um, I've been playing with advancing irregular twills and meaning that that they change. As you can see, you'll get you'll get a very twill pattern, then it turns into something else. Um, it's a challenge because I have a 16 shaft loom, but I don't like to use all 16. I like to reserve four shafts for the selvage. So I try to do as much as I can possibly do on 12. But there's it's a real challenge designing these twills that are interesting, but don't have long floats. Okay, this is here uh, because I have two things to say about this. One is this is all hand spun wool. It is merino is the darker red and Polworth, which is the lighter. Um, both very super soft uh, yarns as they were. But what I really wanted to say is I think, and I'm guilty too, I get hung up on the multi shaft kind of thing. And don't, sometimes I overlook the bounty offered on four shafts. This is a simple four shaft weave, which as you can see is reversible. It's a, it's a weave, I, in fact, I had didn't even know about it 10 years ago. It's called Bumbaret, it's from the 18th century. Uh, four shaft, it is, not a, it is not a twill, but it's threaded like one. But it's, I was looking for a, um, a weave that would not kill the hand spun. Because the problem with hand spun is when you put in some, 
you know, really lovely pattern and, and you just kill the hand spun. So I wanted the hand spun to shine. And um, that's my, at the, today, right now, that's my favorite weave for doing it. So the simpler the weave structure, the better with hand spun, right? It, th that's my, that's my opinion. I, I think you want, you want it to shine. I mean, it's special. It, it's hard. It has its own unique properties, but you can kill it putting in a lot of patterning and uh, it just, it, you, you can overdo it. And I, I can't speak for you, but sometimes when I am planning something, I tend to over design and then I back off again uh, because I want to do everything in one. And then I wait a minute, let's stop here and see what we've got and what do I really want to accomplish with this? Did you spin it? I did. I did. It's my Zen moment in the evening many times. Oh. I just included this because um, I've done a lot of Kumihimo when I, uh, I had a business for a while and I taught and I did a workshop. This one I did several years, you know, it's been maybe three or four years ago, I suppose. I had this piece that's onyx on one side and malachite on the other. And it just seemed to me that it really needed a divided braid, which in this case is a braid that is starts from the middle and is worked out on each side. So it, it is all one braid underneath. And then of course, there are the supplemental braids that, that are part of it as well. Then that's that's silk. Uh, the braid is silk. Um, I was introduced to it uh, at City and Guilds, as a matter of fact. It it had really was very very new at that time. What happened? The Japanese guilds were very secretive, as you might well imagine, and they these braids that were woven were unique to the braiding houses. They used them on uh, samurai. Uh, armor. If you look at if you look at samurai armor, they're all held together with these tiny silk braids because the silk braids are so firm that they would resist a spear. Uh, they used them on their swords. They used them on the hilts, obi that go around kimonos. Very used. But of course, as Japanese women were wear and men were not wearing and needing these braids, the Japanese braiding houses really realized they needed to do something because an open, they opened a little bit. So they started having um, teaching Japanese housewives braiding. And from that, uh, that was in the mid fifties. We're not talking a hundred years even here. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, Makiko Tada, who is still, I mean, she's still alive and she's done phenomenal things. She's gone on to do other things in Tokyo. And Roderick Owen in Britain, I studied with both of them. And those two people are the ones who really uh, brought Kumihimo into the Western world. And of course, it is, you know, very popular now and a lot of, a lot of people are doing it. But um that's and and you can even buy the little foam discs. I really don't like the foam discs. Um, you know, it's like any other piece of equipment. What you do really is dependent on the quality of your equipment in many cases. And um, I really prefer a Meridite to do it on. And and for a while, my husband made Meridites and, and we had a, um, we made bobbins and sold them and that that was the little business that we don't do anymore no okay this is the Navajo rug that you spoke of earlier. this is it it is not you know it's not a two gray hills or any you know it's I still love it I believe that's a spirit trail in the upper right but I have no absolute confirmation but since they typically did that and especially as it has aged it, I can even see it more clearly than when it was brand new I can't take it off the wall because of course the pine now it's much lighter behind the, behind the rug so it's got to stay there <laughs>
Beautiful. But this is all all vegetable dyed. And I think of the woman who who wove it. Uh, you have seen this. I've seen it, but uh, I'd like to hear about it. And uh, if you could mention the recognition it got. Oh, that, you mean, oh, the recognition. It was, um, you mean the Philadelphia Guild? Yes, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the name of the award. It did have an award, yes. Uh, but it is a uh, wool and linen uh, rug made using a shaft switching device, which Katie knows well. Um, so, and, and as I've told you, I have done rugs for a long time, different rugs. Uh, until I got a shaft switching device, I did not do use that, obviously. I didn't make my own shaft switching device. But yes, this was in the Philadelphia Celebrations of Fiber last year. What have you enjoyed about using a shaft switching system? I like I like the design possibilities. I mean, there are still obviously restrictions on uh, on the blocks and and challenges in use of color, which of course gives it its you know if there were no if you could just sit down and do it, it wouldn't be any fun. So yes, um, I think probably I started doing rugs because when I first started weaving and and had a loom that was heavy enough, I would make rag rugs just to use. It was a utilitarian. Uh, and then, of course, I had different kinds of wool and I was making a totally different style of rug, but still rugs. And so this just kind of been a constant for a long time. Do you ever get discouraged or stuck on a project? And how do you move through that? Oh, <laughs> that absolutely do. Um, what do I do? I walk away because, and I have to keep reminding myself of this all the time, rather than sticking and trying to figure it out. If I walk away and let it, let it sit, let my mind work in the background, I can usually resolve it. Now, not always. I lost a cross. Uh, this summer, <laughs> it was such a mess. And I tried to save it. I couldn't save it. I did walk away. And then when I came back, I cut it off. <laughs> there was just no saving it. And sometimes walking away gives a perspective from a distance, you know? And then some other times issues i think oh i can do i could do it another way rather than the same old way you know i probably i th keep thinking i've made every st mistake that can possibly be made and then i make a new one <laughs> we have to laugh because it you know it just there are a whole a lot of things to think about well that that's the only that's my only issue I like doing the rugs and the big pieces, but what do you do with them after you've made them? You know, I mean, my son has one, my grandson has one, you know, I, I don't know what you do with them, but oh, well, well I could I be doing a golf ball, I suppose, and spending that amount of money. That's where the big family comes in. <laughs> oh, that's true. Well, I take, can tell you that the kitchen towels, even, even uh, I have a, a grandson in med school. Oh, the hap happiest thing I could give him is a towel. Absolutely. Yes. And I made some fun ones that um, I had I, actually, I had been doing some research and came across this idea in handwoven and they had done fairly recently some towel orange towels with black cats and I thought 
Well, my grandson was getting married and I thought, oh, that would be perfect. They have these two cats. One's black, the other's not. Yeah, I changed it. I I can't. I, I say, oh, you're going to make it easy for yourself. You're just going to do a project. And then by the time I look at it, I don't like that color. I don't like the way they do that. And that's not right. And it, the proportions are all wrong. And, you know, silly thing. They loved them. I told my daughter I was giving the, my grandson these things. She said, well, my other sons would like them too. And in fact, I sent one. I have another grandson. I have one, the one that got married. Then there, the next one down's in med school. And the one after that just started as a freshman in college. I mailed it to him soon after he got there. He was thrilled. I thought, why am I doing anything else? You know, it makes people happy. Yeah. I'm just kitchen towels. What the heck? <laughs> just don't ask me for a pair. <laughs> uh, what would you say to people starting out in fiber art? I would say do what you love and keep doing it. And don't, you know, do it. Just do it. I'd say would be three words. Last question. Uh, what's ahead for you in your work? I really... Um, I want to, at some point, show my, show my current work. And that, of course, means assembling enough to do that. That's, that's really the challenge. But I also am interested in pushing the envelope and understanding how some other structures work. I know what I like. I like texture and I like color. Um, so that having that combination work. And I, it doesn't necessarily have to be in anything in particular. Um, I've done a couple of uh, I'll call, I'll, wall pieces, but I'm not real happy with structure. And that is one reason why I'm doing the tapestry with this group so uh that should kind of help with that you know as somebody recently asked me about my favorite fiber story uh when my son and his three children were here they were between houses and my granddaughter came out to my studio and my table loom was set up because it was from a uh, a workshop and it had i think it had 20, 10, 22, 10 cell on it. And uh, she was just fascinated. And could she try it? And I said, sure, you can have anything in here that you can find. Uh, that's what you say, what would you like to do? I would like, I wish we all had that lack of inhibition. She, I sat with my back to her. She only needed help advancing the warp when she needed to. And she found my sparkly stuff. She had fun with that. She, but the diversity, she was weaving with purple sewing thread. It was, I, I thought, you know, we should all be like a seven-year-old in that regard. Just wide open to the possibilities, the what ifs. You know, so the funny thing is, a friend of mine was coming back and had with her something from her aunt. And the friend said to me, do you think your granddaughter would like this? And I said, yeah. I asked my son, well, she wove a scarf on it at Christmas. She got it last year. No, this is the laugh part. The laugh part is that she was playing and she was, you know, playing with it and weaving on it and everything. And then she wanted to cut it off and she cut it off behind the heddles. So, now mind you I what I didn't tell you was she threaded that loom herself and she slayed that loom herself so she can do it but she now needs help rethreading the loom <laughs> so, oh she was seven but it, 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 it's not rocket science you know but the persistence for a seven-year-old to just, I know. And she sat and she did it and she wove that, sewed herself a scarf, took it off, wore it, you know, 
I think we restrict ourselves too often by trying to make it perfect the first time and not being willing to kind of push the limits. Uh, I think I, I, I'm i certainly guilty of that. You know, I kind of stay a little safe, you know. Sometimes pushing the limits is, is good. Well, thank you, Charlene. This has been so fun. <laughs> this has been fun. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you. And thanks for watching. If you like the video, please like, comment, and share, and subscribe to the New York Guild of Hand Weavers YouTube channel. If you're interested in joining the New York Guild of Hand Weavers, please go to nyhandweavers.org. See you in the next video, and until then, happy weaving.